October 5th. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. Revelation 22, 11. It would seem to be the cherished delusion of many that a kind of moral transformation transpires in death, that because death itself is a change of relation around which gathers new sensations, new feelings, new thoughts, new solemnities, new prospects, that therefore the soul passes through a kind of spiritual preparedness to meet its approaching destiny. But such is not the case. The character which time has for years been shaping, it yields to the demands of eternity and the precise mold in which it was formed. Death hands over the soul to the scrutiny and the decisions of the judgment exactly as life relinquished it. The king of terrors has received no commission and possesses no power to effect a moral change in the transit of the spirit to the God who gave it. Its office is to unlock the cell and conduct the prisoner into court. It can furnish no plea. It can suggest no argument. It can correct no error. It can whisper no hope to the pale and trembly being on his way to the bar. The turnkey must present the criminal to the judge, precisely as the officer delivered him to the turnkey, with all the marks and evidences of criminality and guilt clinging to him as at the moment of arrest. The supposition of the multitudes seemed to be just what we have stated, that when the strange and mysterious but unmistakable signs of death are stealing upon them, when the summons to appear before the judge admits of not a doubt, allows of no delay, that then what has been held as truth, and now in the mighty illumination of an unveiling eternity, is found to be error, may be with ease abandoned, and that however negligent, they who have lived all their lifetime with God may have been of religion while the last day appeared distant. And however careless, they who had made a Christian profession may have been of the ground of their confidence and the reason of their hope under an indefinite expectation of appearing in the presence of God. Yet now that the footfall of death is heart approaching and the invisible world becomes visible through the opening chinks of the earthly house of their tabernacle, they will be enabled to summon all the remainder of strength and with the utmost strenuousness turn their undivided attention to the business of saving the soul. But is it really so? Is not the whole course of experience against a supposition so false as this? Do not men die mostly as they have lived? The infantile dies in infidelity. The profligate dies in profligacy. The infantile Profugate dies in profugacy. The infidel dies in infidelity. The profugate dies in profugacy. An atheist dies in atheism. The careless die in indifference, and the formalist dies in formality. There are exceptions to this, undoubtedly, but the exceptions confirm rather than disprove the general fact that men die as they live. In view, then, of this solemn statement, deeply affecting it must be to the Christian professor. If it be thus that our death will derive much of its character and composition from the present tenor of our life, that the proportion of the lack of spirituality and the undue influence which the world has had upon the mind to the habitual distance of the walk with God and the gradual separation from us of those holy, sanctifying influences which go to form the matured, influential, and useful Christian will be the lack of that bright evidence and full assured hope in death which we give to the departing soul an abundant entrance to the everlasting kingdom. Then of what great moment is it that every individual professing godliness should know the exact state of his soul before God?